Hello, and welcome to Science Matters, the holiday edition. I'm your host, Lawrence Krauss, and I'm happy to be back in our studio here. I want to begin by actually going to a photograph I took yes yesterday here in Phoenix in the early evening. So as you can see from this image, which I took from a friend's backyard in Phoenix, the two bright objects in the sky, and if you have a telescope or if you like to uh, know where the planets are, you'll recognize that they're, those are Jupiter and Saturn that are fairly close together. And if you've been watching them each night, they've been getting closer and closer together. The next image I have is a, is a, is a more professional image uh, where it's darker and you can see the galaxy and you can see the two bright objects, which are Jupiter and Saturn. And they're about to have a conjunction. On December 21st of this year, they'll get as close as they've been in 800 years as seen from the Earth. They'll get to within one-tenth of a degree from each other that's the, that's, if you, that's the distance if you hold a dime out at arm's length. That's about the amount they'll be separated by. And that'll be the closest they will have come. And there are conjunctions all the time, but the closest the conjunction we've had in 800 years will be December 21st of this year. So go out and look at those two beautiful planets in the night sky. And when I, when I looked at that the other day, it reminded me of a holiday story of my own, because when I was a kid, I used to go to Planetaria. I loved going to Planetaria. And most Planetarium shows would have a holiday show where they try and run their, their projector backwards to position the planets and stars and go back 2,000 years to see what the night sky looked like 2,000 years ago to see if they could find the famous star of Bethlehem, which is mentioned in one, on only one of the scriptures, uh, where the, supposedly the three magi came and were guided by the star of Bethlehem in the east to head towards Bethlehem. And people, and, and of course, what the, what the planetarium people would like to do, and, uh, and various astronomers try to do, is go back and see if there was anything significant in the East that would have happened. Now, there was a conjunction, just like this December 21st, of Jupiter and Saturn around 4 BC. There were a few conjunctions, but it was nowhere near as spectacular as the one we're, we're seeing now, we're going to see now. They came within a degree of each other, which is pretty far apart, which is more than the size of the moon, about... Um, uh, apart from each other. And it really would have been nothing special. Astrologers at the time would have known. Of, they wouldn't have seen it as a single star, and they would have known the planets were moving there. And uh, as I say, it won't even be as, as, as anywhere near. It would be 10 times further apart than as they are now on December 21st. So there was no conjunction uh, that might be interpreted as a special event in the East, a star in the East. And there weren't, other, there weren't any really other astronomical... There may have been comets in the sky, but... But again, astrologers knew the difference between comets and single stars. There may, around then, there may have been a supernova, an exploding star. Sometime it's recorded in, in, in um, if you think about it, in the early, early periods between 50 BC and, and maybe 4 BC during the time of Herod, by the way, which is at the time of the conjunction when they're one degree apart. Um, but it wasn't, wouldn't have been clear that they would have been in, it wouldn't have been in the east. And also, it, would, it wasn't clear that it was even recorded visually in the sky, um, in, in this area of the world, in any case. As far as we can tell, there's nothing special that caused a star of Bethlehem. Uh, and, um, and maybe that's a pity for some people. But, uh, but th it's, a, it's, a, it's a mythical story that, in, that it helped create part of the magic of, of at that time, of, of, of what we now know as the Christmas season. And it caused me, at the same time, to think of another image that I'd seen in the last week or two that I want to share with you. I shared it on Twitter last week, and I'm amazed by it. It comes from the uh, uh, European Space Agency, from the Gaia Orbiting Spacecraft uh, uh, Observatory. And the Gaia mission was designed to look at stars in our galaxy and just look at them each night and measure the position. And this is a little moving image of a billion stars in our galaxy, and by watching their position every night, they could try and get over the course of a year or two years some trajectory of looking for a proper motion of the star in the sky to look at what the kind of motions of those stars would be. And then they calculated that and projected now, not 2,000 years in the future, but millions of years in the future. This is what how the stars that are now in the night sky will be moving over the course of millions of years. Because their motion in the actual sky is pretty imperceptible in any, any given year. In fact, when I, um, when I was a kid, uh, one of the things I wondered about the, when going back 2,000 years was, would the positions of the stars in the sky have moved relative to us? Would the constellations have been the same? Partly, you know, they're not, they would have been the same, partly because, you know, astrology was developed in Alexandria several thousands of years ago, and the 
silly little astronomical Im- astrological images that they imagined of bears and 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 snakes and other things are the same today as they were then when you look up at the sky so you know they haven't changed much but there's a reason you can understand that and that's realizing as w- looking at a little calculation I want to do for you now to see how much the sun has moved through the galaxy in the last 2000 years we're moving on average 200 kilometers per second which in the obscure units used in the United States is about 120 miles per second now If you want to consider how far we have moved over the last 2,000 years, you have to consider 120 miles per second times 3,600 seconds per hour times 24 hours per day, that's 24 hours per day, times 365 days per year, times 2,000 years. And the answer is, in the last 2,000 years, our position in the galaxy has moved by... 7,568,640,000,000 miles, or about 7.57 trillion miles. We've moved an incredible amount, or have we? Well, if you work that out, that means in the last 2,000 years, we've moved just slightly more than one light year across uh, across the galaxy. Now, the nearest star to us, Alpha Centauri, is four light years away. So we've moved less than the dis- one quarter of the distance uh, to the nearest star. And in order for, therefore, for Alpha Centauri to have significantly changed its position relative to us, we would have to have been moving parallel to the motion and opposite the motion of, of Alpha Centauri, which is not the case. But for all other stars further away, h- tens or hundreds of light years away, their position in the sky would have changed by just a marginal amount between now and back in 4 B.C., so the night sky, the position of the star, the bottom line is the position of stars in the night sky, except for the few nearest stars, which have been, which have moved a little bit, is, is such that the, the night sky would have looked more or less the same. The constellations would have been slightly altered, but, but very, but very minimally at best. And so the night sky, as seen by the original uh, Alexandrians who started astrology and, 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 and created those uh, looked up at the sky and imagined they saw bears or or snakes or other things. Those constellations looked the same thousands of years ago as they did now. So the bottom line is, when you go back and look at uh, the night sky back then, even if you include the motion of stars, I'm going back to this Gaia thing, over simply 2,000 years, you wouldn't see any change. So there would have been no movement that would have caused a bright star to be in the sky around the time that, that uh, one of the biblical uh, stories talks about a bright star in the sky and Magi seeing it, the Star of Bethlehem. And the only kind of uh, astronomical events that, that would have been uh, standard ones would have been the conjunction of Saturn and, and Jupiter or maybe a conjunction of one of the planets close by another star. But they weren't. there was nothing spectacular about it, nothing to be noticed, nothing to be significantly different than any other time. They're over the 50 years BC, there may have been some supernovae, but again, they wouldn't have been in the east. And, um, and in fact, there's no evidence that they were uh, 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 seen in, in, in that part of the world. Even though when I was a kid, the, the, it was fun to go back and see that conjunction of, of Jupiter and Saturn, there was nothing special that would have caused uh, um, uh, anything to be recorded around that time. And that, and I remind you, that biblical story is only in one of the of the biblical stories of that period. So uh, the story of the of the of the Magi coming and being guided by a star of Bethlehem is, like many other aspects of of the Bible, a a, a, um, a mythical story that uh, creates a special time at that at that moment. But that doesn't mean the holidays aren't magical, and uh, they're still magical for me. When I when I think about going back in time, there's another. Uh, scientific observation that's just been reported, which I find magical in many, many ways. And it makes me think of the same kind of things that I thought about when I was a kid, but now uh, knowing a little more about how the universe actually works. The uh, observation I want to talk about comes from an amazing, for me, it's, it's really poetic. This is an image of a Japanese scientist in the Australian outback carrying very carefully a capsule that was released by their uh, Japan's uh, Hayabusa 2 probe. It's a probe that was launched six years ago to get near an asteroid, the Ryugu asteroid. And what, what that mission, what the, what the uh, Hayabusa 2 
mission did was actually go down and probe the asteroid by poking it and releasing dusk and then actually going down a second time to the surface of that asteroid and having a little explosive go off and then poking down in that crater, having dust come up, which they which they stored in a capsule. And then the, the, the spacecraft came back towards the Earth and when it got near the Earth, it released a capsule containing that sample. That capsule was then on a, on a parachute and went, came through the atmosphere, returning like the capsules for holding astronauts. And in the next image, you can see the streak of the sky as that capsule came down and landed somewhere in the outback in Western Australia, uh, the, an artist's rendering is shown in the next image where you can see the, uh, the, uh, the heat shield of the capsule being released and then the capsule and a parachute uh, as it floated down to Earth. The Japanese uh, scientists created a, a trajectory with a lot of radio receivers because this capsule had a radio transmitter so that within a 30-mile radius they could find it. And eventually they did find it. And if you, you go back to this scientist and there he is holding the capsule. I find that amazingly romantic because that capsule was literally on the surface of an asteroid going, orbiting through the solar system. Now, why did they want to find dust from that, um, from that satellite? Just a little bit of dust, maybe the amount of dust in a grain of rice. The answer is that the material, unlike the material in the Earth, which has been recycled as the Earth, due to all the global plate tectonics and etc the earth these asteroid the it, the material in the asteroid is primordial it's directly from the time 4.55 billion years ago when the solar system began to form if you uh think about that what this what this japanese uh, astronomer is holding scientists holding is a little time capsule from the beginning of time before life on Earth even happened. It holds maybe the key to our origins. Because when this material is uh, analyzed, they'll be looking not just at the, at, at the standard carbon content, but they'll be looking for organic materials. They'll be looking for the materials that were the primordial materials that were delivered to the planet. And I, I don't know, I just find it amazing to think that this guy's holding this capsule that's been to an asteroid and back. Farther than basically uh, holding something that's been more almost farther than anything else that's ever gone out into the into our solar system and returned. I find it poetic not just because we've been able to do that, but because the time of the time capsule that this holds. It takes us back not to a time 2000 years ago, but to a time 4.55 billion years ago. And if we want to learn about our own origins, we don't now go to the Bible, but we want to go to nature and we want to learn about our own origins and perhaps the precursors to life on earth. For me, that's, that's poetic for another reason. Because if I think back to what's, what started this digression, as I, um, as I thought about those, those um, early planetarium shows that I, that I saw and the ESA little movie that I showed you, we can think about, well, that material that came, that eventually formed our solar system was emitted by an exploding star about five billion years ago. That material compressed the gas and eventually formed our, the, the sun and our solar system and objects orbiting around the sun 4.55 billion years ago. And this is part of the primordial material that did that. But the interesting thing is, if you think about the fact that we've been moving relative to other stars and that star that exploded that, that left a neutron star somewhere there, we've been moving at random at 200 kilometers per second on average relative to each other over the last four and a half billion years. What does that mean? If you think about it, since that material was collected and since that material was produced, the sun and solar system has gone around our galaxy about 22 times. It takes 200 million years for our sun to go around the galaxy. So we've gone 22 times around our galaxy in the time it's taken since that material was first solidified to form that asteroid. And, that, and so we've taken a version of, uh, of our own solar system spacecraft through the galaxy, in some sense exploring the galaxy, and the material, the, 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 the star that originally exploded that produced that material that came out to form our solar system, that star is separated by us now, perhaps by the entire width of our galaxy. We've been moving relative to one another, and just as you can see from the GIF, which I'll show again here from, from ESA, the random motions are such that, that material that was originally 
the material, the primordial material that created us has now been distributed in many ways throughout the whole galaxy. So to go back to the final image, which is the image that originally got me started thinking about this when I saw those two, Saturn and Jupiter, close together at night, and it reminded me of the, the holiday planetarium shows I saw. While the real world, while science has shown us that there's not likely to have been a star of Bethlehem, if we can use the inspiration we get from thinking about things like, like that and thinking about a planetarium show to think about our galaxy, to think about our solar system, to think about our own origins and the amazing fact that we're in a spacecraft traveling 120 miles per second through our galaxy. If we can use that to, to, to help enhance the awe and wonder we feel about the real universe, then that's truly the magic of the holidays, which is really thinking about how lucky we are to be here in a magical universe and how we can celebrate not only our own origins, but each other. So with that, I wish you a very happy holiday and we'll see you again next year. From Science Matters, this is Lawrence Krauss. Take care. <laughs>